Hey everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. Hey everybody, welcome back. We are in chapter 19 of John today, and what is probably familiar to you is the story of the death of Jesus. He is actually being crucified um, and actually dies on the cross in this chapter. There's a couple of things that kind of sparked our interest as we were reading over this story, things that we have heard before, but also things that were like minor details that were maybe a little bit more detailed than what we've heard in the past from other gospels. So, um, yeah, we're going to just dive into this chapter <laughs> again, or what seems to be like the story again, uh, but maybe picking out a couple of those those newer things. This will be a great chapter to read on your own because I just finished doing the reading and I'm getting over a cold and it's a little <laughs> bit rocky. So uh, go ahead and read it for yourself uh, or I guess stick around to be entertained by me struggling to read it. <laughs> he sounds like he's really moved by it, which I think you are <laughs> truly, but not necessarily while you're reading it this time. But anyway... So uh, I guess something that stuck out to me at the beginning of this chapter, this is like when Jesus is being handed over to be crucified. I kind of just, I noticed that Pilate, he's getting frustrated. I know with myself, like you do weird things when you get frustrated or angry and Pilate starts to do things I think that are a result of his anger and frustration. So like, oh yeah, he definitely hands Jesus over to be flogged. But then on top of that, the chief priests in verse six And the officers, when they saw Jesus with his crown of thorns and all the things, Pilate says to them, behold the man. Okay, like here's the one that you guys are all making this huge fuss about. Um, The chief priests and the officers yell out, crucify him, crucify him. Mm -hmm. And I think like Pilate starts to get irritated. He's like, I don't have anything wrong with this guy in the first place. And you guys are the ones that want him dead so badly. Why don't you just do it? Pilate is in such a unique situation position because Jerusalem at this time is like a tinderbox just waiting to be lit off, which is going to happen eventually. And so Pilate is trying to uh, balance the Roman expectations on him to govern this place well. He's trying to appease the Jews in general, but also the leaders of the Jews. He doesn't want to have a riot. He doesn't want to have an uprising. And so you can see him like making kind of unique decisions here and there that are like, fine, I'll give you what you want, but not exactly what you want. And you can see that he like genuinely appears to not want to crucify Jesus. Um, At one point, it actually says that he is like scared of him, right? Yeah, like Pilate is afraid. If you look at verse eight, it says when Pilate heard this. Okay, I'll back that up. In verse seven, it says the Jews answered him, we have a law according to the law he must die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So it's worth digging into this because Pilate kind of seeks out a second personal audience with Jesus. And Pilate is having some kind of, something is going on with this guy that he's like, okay, who is this? And Mm -hmm. Most likely it's because Pilate is at least like supernaturally aware. Um, He's like aware of gods. And so he probably doesn't want to be held accountable for killing a god. Um, But also it's very unlikely that he believes Jesus is God. I know like um, I've been kind of like personally intrigued by Pilate's story uh, because there are some ancient accounts of Pilate becoming a missionary. Uh, But that seems very, very extremely unlikely. It's uh, probably more likely that Pilate just doesn't want to kill the wrong person and cause the wrong Mm -hmm. kind of uprising or tension or whatever. That's what I was thinking. Because like if you put this into actual like real life terms, if this was you, just because this group of people is really frustrated with him, he doesn't know if this is some great guy to someone else who is, Mm -hmm. you know, very important. So I think he's just trying to protect himself in this moment. Uh, Because he doesn't want to, like, make anybody mad, whether it's a person or if it's actually God himself. He doesn't want to have this blood on his hands either. Um, So he does have a moment with Jesus where um, he's actually asking him, like, who, like, where are you actually from? Because I don't want to mess this up. Mm -hmm. Um, And Jesus, like, doesn't give him a response. And Pilate's like, listen, I have the authority Mm -hmm. to let you go. And if you don't start talking, I can't do anything. 
Um, so it's just like this really odd situation that he gets stuck in. I am not jealous of him at all. I do think he has his flaws for sure because again, like his his uh, his fuse is getting quite short. Mm-hmm. He's gonna like just hand him over soon to do what they want eventually. And if you pay attention to, I mean, he eventually does allow Jesus to be crucified, obviously. Mm -hmm. But if you pay attention to to the decisions he makes along the way, he actually uses the crucifixion of Jesus as a way to mock the Jewish leaders who he resents, but is also doing what they want. So, like, he he doesn't like these guys, but he sees no way forward other than Mm -hmm. to crucify Jesus. So the first thing he does is dress him up like a king. And then, hand, like, like well, they would not have expected him to be marched out, dressed up like a ruler. Right. And he even refers to Jesus yes. as their king. He says, well, here you go. Behold your king. And they get really upset. They would not like that because like, he's uh, mocking no, them. No, take him away. Kill this guy because he's not our king at all. But, again, like, Pilate isn't really having it with really any of them at this point right he's very over it mm-hmm. and then he puts a sign like it's it's very normal for the men to have charges like listed above them so that people could know why they're being crucified and so Pilate writes in several different languages the king of the jews and this again is just to anger the jewish leaders which it does mm-hmm. and they're like hey don't don't say he is the king of the jews say he said he was the king of the jews and Pilate's like hey what I've done, I've done. <laughs> you can deal. Yeah. yeah. So we get to the point now where Jesus is offered. Um, well, he's he's on the cross and he's offered um, some sour wine, which have, would have been very typical. Um, that'd be like a, a very common drink. I, whenever I used to hear that, I used to always think like, oh, gross. Like, like what a t- terrible thing to do somebody who's like on their way to death. Uh, but it is actually something that Jesus was offered to also, if you look in verse 28, to fulfill scripture, uh, Jesus actually asks for a drink and he is given this drink. And from that moment um, after he he gives up his spirit mm-hmm. and he dies. So what I was telling Ryan before this episode even started was like, it's interesting to me that Jesus is fulfilling all these prophecies during his life, his ministry. And then as he's dying, he is still continuing mm-hmm. to fulfill prophecy and even after. So like, the life of Jesus is just like completely marked by God's complete plan for um, salvation for us. So it's really interesting just to see those prophecies still be being fulfilled even to the very end of his actual life. And John is going to call out these prophecies. Um, one of them, he, he calls it out specifically in verse 36. Um, he's talking about how his, so I guess to explain further, they would, they would break the legs of people who were crucified because like crucifixion lasts for a long time. You mm-hmm. live for quite a while on the cross. And so they would um, break their legs to speed up their deaths um, if their dying in public was inconvenient for whatever they had well, planned. It like prevented them from being able to yeah. breathe correctly. What or you would do is like push up your body on your legs so that you could continue to breathe. And when they would break your legs, then you would no longer have the ability to push yourself up to breathe any further, and it would speed up your death. So they do this with the criminals that are around Jesus, but when they come to do it to Jesus, he's already dead. And so verse 36, John calls out, for these things took place that scripture might be fulfilled, saying not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says they will look on him whom they have pierced. So they they refuse to break his bones because he's already dead, but they did stab him in the side. And when they stabbed him in the side, blood and water came out. So John is making a point of saying, hey, two prophecies he fulfilled, even in his death. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I do always like to point out the prophecies that prophecies um, that could not have been like planned out by Jesus ahead of time. Like he did not have, obviously God yeah. has control over him, but if he was just like a scheming man, he couldn't have done that. Right. He wouldn't have been able to put all of those pieces together. Like, hey, make sure this guy stabs me in the right, side after right. I'm dead. Like, that's ridiculous. Right. Um, you wanted to point out something going on with uh, Nicodemus. One and- of my, and, and uh, Joseph of Arimathea. One of my yeah. favorite things with the book of John is, I guess this is like the Ryan commentary, I guess. Mm-hmm. I love thinking of the book of John as like a, a kind of a narrative of Nicodemus. Because mm-hmm. in John chapter 3, 
Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night to say like, hey, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And he comes at night because he's nervous about being, you know, seen. He's nervous about being judged by other religious leaders, other Pharisees. And here we're getting close to the end of the book now. And he shows up to help to bury Jesus. So I think he shows up in chapter three, uh, chapter seven, and now in chapter 19. Um, and it's, it seems to be that Nicodemus has come to a place of belief in Jesus. And the, the reason I say that, and like I, the more I say the Bible, the more I firm up my belief in that. If you look at verse 38, it says, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus. So John actually calls out specifically that Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple. Um, but then he adds in verse 39, Nicodemus also who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about 75 pounds in weight. Like the two guys show up to make sure that Jesus is properly buried. And John actually introduces the two guys essentially by saying like Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple and also Nicodemus was there. I don't think he's saying that Joseph was a believer and Nicodemus wasn't. I think he's saying that they came together as a pair to make sure that Jesus was cared for. Well, it's cool to see that actually coming because I know we, we talked about Nicodemus in the beginning, like you said, and like hearing him say those words, sometimes it's like, well, it's nice to hear people say things, but like putting feet to what you actually yes. believe is like very, very different. So at the end of Jesus' life, having him actually come back and really like show what he believes or stick to what he said is, I don't know, it's it's kind of exciting because I don't feel like that has been that's like not been the case for many of these leaders yeah. in any way shape or form it's also really cool to think about the fact that the very first person to hear John three sixteen, uh, which is probably yeah. like the most popular evangelistic verse ever mm-hmm. actually comes to a place where he's very well likely a disciple of Jesus mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's pretty cool so here as we're at the end of Jesus life and ministry in the book of John what do you think a good your part is for us today? So I am constantly intrigued by Pilate. And I also really like how John is, the book of John is sort of about Nicodemus. I know that's sort of a stretch. Uh, but if you look in this chapter, you have two guys who went like an extra mile to get to talk to Jesus. Both with power. Both with power, both with influence, both seeking a personal audience with just Jesus you have Nicodemus, who seems to have readjusted the course of his life and came to a place of worshiping Jesus. You have Pilate, where it's like, man, I think this guy just got annoyed at how much Jesus was disrupting uh, what's going on with him. If you've if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, um, last year, I think I would have said like, huh, it's kind of interesting that we have no idea where Pilate mm-hmm. landed. I think it's pretty fair to say that Pilate did not become a follower of Jesus. Like the more I read about it, the more I study about it, it just seems like that really did not happen. A far-fetched. And it was kind of like a fairy tale that got created in around the third century, I think. Um, but it is interesting that we have two men that made a point to get a personal audience with Jesus. And one of them had their lives completely transformed. I think that's fair to say of Nicodemus. And the other just kind of was annoyed and mm-hmm. maybe like temporarily thought about it, but didn't really do anything about it. Um, and I think it's a challenge for us. Like we, we all, um, know something about Jesus. I mean, even just by listening to this podcast, you're learning a little bit more about Jesus. And I think you do need to come to a place of decision. And I know many of you already have come to a place of decision, but just continue to strengthen your faith and grow in your relationship with Jesus. Like if nothing else, hear this account of Jesus' crucifixion and be encouraged by the fact that he was fulfilling prophecy even after he died. Um, but definitely come to a place where you are transformed by Jesus and you're not just somebody who's like sort of intrigued and curious about Jesus. We, we all have to come to a place of decision and we all have to build our lives on that decision. Thanks for joining today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. As always, please consider partnering with us as we are a listener-supported podcast that we hope to continue to grow with support from listeners just like you. We've made it super easy to partner with us, and you can support us by following the link in our show notes or our description. You can support us with as little as $3 a month. Every little bit of this helps so much, and we're so thankful for your support. With that in mind, here's today's reading. John chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. 
they came up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so that they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and then they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. 
and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible, or if you'd like to use the one that we use, uh, reach out to us via email, and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.